Alrighty, how many of us are ready to get into God's Word this morning? Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about a new series this morning that I'm entitling, The Journey is the Destination. The Journey is the Destination. How many of us know who has found out by, by now we should all be of age to know that life is, in fact, a journey and not a destination? Right? I mean, from the cradle to the grave, you are on a journey. And may I submit to you this morning that really the journey doesn't really begin for us until we've accepted Christ the Lord. Right? That's when the journey takes on all kinds of different textures and meanings and levels and depths of, uh, of life that we didn't even know existed. You know, I'm telling you what, I gave my life at, at such a young age to the Lord that you know, I just didn't know any better. I had not really lived a lot of life. I was 15, a couple, couple days shy of being 16 years old. But I can tell you this, I had lived enough life in the world, in the culture, to know that that's not the kind of life I wanted to live. That I, was, I wanted more. I was thirsting and hungering for more. And then I had a friend of mine uh, that uh, I kind of made fun of, to be quite honest with you, in my sophomore year of high school. He was a junior. And the Lord brought him across my path, and he started sharing about Jesus. At first, I mocked him. I laughed at him. I ridiculed him and all that fun stuff. And then I'll never forget the moment that he was leaning across the table at the cafeteria there in the high school, and he said, Joe, every guy, every guy that has laughed at me ended up being like me. And I'm telling you, that put the fear of God in me. He got my attention, and from then on, the Holy Spirit started working in my heart, and I, I came to the, uh, to the place, and please understand how I say this. I'm only talking about my upbringing, okay? I'm not talking about any religious institution here. I came to the point in my life where I knew for a fact that Jesus was Lord and not Mary was Lord. Amen? Amen? I'm just talking about my upbringing here, all right? And so I, I came to that point, and then... Uh, a couple weeks later, I, uh, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, you know, and that's when my journey really began. You know, I, I think that many of us are suffer, I know I have for, the, for a big part of my life, suffer from destination disease. That's what I'll call it. I'll call it destination disease. You know, we're, we're ready to go to the next part of life. We live this part, we were... Grade schoolers, who remembers your grade school years? I do. I was in and out of the principal's office. <laughs> and I got that paddle, and man alive, that was, uh, that was real discipline there, right? Who longs to have that back in the schools? How many of us know that a lot of the problems that we have now with kids being mouthy and disrespectful and defiant to authority, that would never exist because who's found out along with me that there's a more direct connection between here and here than between here and here? Amen. Yeah. Dr. Paddle cured a lot of bad behavior in me, let me tell you. But it seems like we go, especially you, Terry. <laughs> you rebel. Uh, but we go from grade school to junior high to high school. You know, life is just a series of events, isn't it? And it is a journey, but, you know, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves, if we suffer from destination disease, we'll begin to say these words, I'll be glad when, and then we can fill in the blank, I'll be happy when, come on somebody, gosh, I'll be happy when I get to high school, you get to high school, gosh, I'll be happy when I graduate. You graduate. Some, some decide to go to college. I'll be happy when I finally get my degree. And then you get out and then I'll be happy when I can land a job. And then you get your job. I'll be happy when I retire. And you know what? You waste an entire life never happy because you think that happiness is found on the next stop. Amen. Who's with me? Amen. You never arrive. You never arrive. To my point, life is a journey. And listen, the journey is the destination. Don't suffer from destination disease 
enjoy the journey every part of the journey knowing who has found out that knowing that whatever season you might be in life today on your journey that that season is not permanent Amen. who has found out with me that life is in fact as james called it a vapor you know those of you sweet young families who have kids <laughs> i'm sure you've heard this a million times enjoy them because they grow so fast you know what I, I think back when my girls were little and I thought where did those years go and sometimes I have little tears thinking I wish I had been more present you know I was physically present at all of their activities and gosh my ex-wife made sure they were involved in everything <laughs> and I thank God when Gabby was at her last band performance and I thought this is it I see the light at the end of the tunnel I'm done paying my daddy dues with all these events that I had to go I, I'm serious I was rejoicing anyway but that passes quickly so we have to enjoy and embrace the journey for what it is, it is not meant to be, life was not meant to be a series of destinations. It was just meant to be a journey cradle to the grave. Amen? So, you know, I, I'm very careful what I post on Facebook. And, and there was a Christian, gosh, page that said, you know, God gave us a vaccine. You know, listen, let me say here, everybody's entitled to your opinion about the vaccine. Did you hear me say that? But how many of y'all know as your pastor, I also have an opinion. And my opinion was to say, I think it's a blessing. It's a God-given blessing. Okay, that's all I said. How many of y'all know that that statement in itself should not be a statement that stirred the pot? That's just my opinion. Am I entitled to that opinion even as you're entitled to yours, right? I don't knock yours. You don't knock mine. There's always inevitable, church family, listen to me. I'm very, very careful what I post or comment on in Christian pages because there's always one who claims to be God's little helper. How many of us know that God does not need any helpers? But they're like God's little helper, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and then there's a little helper here to make sure that the Father's doing his job, that the Son's doing his job, and the Holy Spirit's doing his job, and that I'm not meddling or that I'm not the rebel rouser, right? And, and this person said something like, uh, do you realize that from that vaccine you claim to be a gift from God I could just hear it it was like it was like the church lady all over from Saturday Night Live could it be Satan <laughs> remember when she used to do this Kiki yes. <laughs> I, I want to see you do that bestie <laughs> sorry <laughs> oh, yes sir you get it all the time <laughs> So, so anyway, that this gift of God that you got came from aborted fetuses? How can you live with that? I'm like, oh gosh, spare me. And I said, quite simply, I didn't abort the babies. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 why do we complicate the issues? I did not, I don't believe in abortion, okay? And let me say here, for those that are within earshot, if you have had an abortion, God forgives, come on somebody, and God loves you. And God wants to give you healing for the trauma you sustained in having that abortion. See, we got we to gotta end on the note of redemption, church family, and not condemnation. But anyway, so another God's little helper popped up. I mean, they're all over the place, like little, oh yeah, little Pharisee lurking in the shadows. And he said, well, yeah, that's a problem with some of you Christians. It's all about me, me, me. You guys ought to read some of the stuff on the feed because you'll see my comments. And I said, brother, I said, I'm not about, I said, I'm all about whole life, cradle to grave, not just term life. Amen. Let me say here, if you're a, an abortion 
uh, anti-abortion, pro-life champion, more power to you. But buddy, don't lose sight that life does not end after conception. It goes all the way to the grave. We should respect human life cradle to the grave. Okay, I'm done with that little pet peeve. It's out of the way. All right, do you have your Bibles handy? Yes. I didn't have you turn there initially because really we're going to open it up to the first book of the Bible. That should not be difficult, right? Shouldn't take a long time. Genesis chapter 12, please. So far, so good, everybody? Got my introduction out of the way. Genesis chapter 12. We're going to put the scripture up on the screen. The scripture up on the screen is New International Version. I'm going to be quoting out of the New King James Version. Genesis 12. Let's begin reading with verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And I will and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, or his nephew, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the Terebinth tree of Moreh. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there, notice carefully, notice what, notice what Abram did. And there he did what? He built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent. He did what? He pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built what? He built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And so Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Now notice carefully. What I want you to, what I want us to see this morning from the scripture is that was not Abram, when God called him, was not Abram on a journey. He was on a journey, right? He went from place to place, and he did two things primarily. He did what to his tents? He pitched his tents, and he did what to altars? Built an altar. Notice carefully, those are contrasted with each other. Let me say here, in our lives, on this journey we are on, it is advisable, listen carefully, church family, that I think we get it wrong sometimes, that we pitch our tents and that we build our altars. And not build our tents and pitch our altars. What's the difference? You know, when you pitch a tent, how many of us know we pitch that tent because it's a temporary dwelling place right it's not a house it's not a permanent place of dwelling it's a temporary place of dwelling who has found that in your journey or on your journey you will pitch a lot of tents right didn't we just mention you know like for me I, I got married initially when I was 22 years old and so but I was single for 22 years and so at, at the age of 22 I got married was married for 29 years and then there was divorce and so you know I pitched my tent as a single man for 22 years and then as a married man for 29 years and then as a single man again <laughs> I pitched that different tent and then last June I pitched the tent of marriage again amen see what I'm getting at life is full of tents that will be pitched they're temporary we don't build a tent right 
let me ask it this way. I'm sure there are a few of us here who has lived in the same house all your life. Nobody? Right? Doesn't that speak to the fact that uh, life is changing? You know, we, we came off of a series a couple, couple series ago that life is changing constantly and that we have to hold to our changeless core, right? And so life changes, so that's why we have to pitch our tents. There are temporary phases of life. You know, what, what pitching your tent really means is, who's ever heard, I bet none of you have ever heard this statement, and it came to pass. How many of us know that many things that come down the pike, they come to pass, they don't come to stay. So we pitch our tents. But notice, that's not where Abraham stopped. That's not the only thing he did. He went from place to place to place to place, pitching tents, and he did what as well? He built altars. So let me ask you this question. On this journey, are we not just, are we only pitching tents and not building altars? Building an altar is more permanent, isn't it? Very interesting that in, in, in uh, Genesis 12, when, you know, he, God, God's calling Abraham on this journey. And so he left the place that he, he knew the Ur of the Chaldees, and he's wandering now by the leading of the Lord, and so he's pitching his tents. But then he stops, and he builds a permanent altar of worship to the Lord. Listen, church family, as believers, it is vital that we understand that on this journey, we must build altars to the Lord. Well, what do those altars look like? Well, bear with me. I'm not going to give you the whole bale of hay today. Right? But we build altars. Listen, it is important, the first altar that Abraham built, Abram built. Let's go to Genesis chapter 13, please. Notice verses 3 and 4. From the Negev, he went from, a, from place to place. That's why he had to pitch tents. He went from place to place until he came to Bethel. Bethel in the Hebrew means the house of God. El means God. Beth means house. The house of God to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier and where he had, where he had first built an altar, there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Why did Abram build his altar? Because what happened there? He, look at the next line, he built his first altar. That's not, he, only, he didn't only build one altar, he built many altars to the Lord. But there he did what to the name of the Lord? called on the name of the Lord. We can say this, listen carefully, that's where Abram got saved, quote unquote, according to the light of his knowledge of God. Doesn't Romans chapter 10 verse 13 say, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved? Isn't that where Abram got saved? He came into a living relationship with God, and that was his first altar. Listen, the first altar we, we all will ever build is our giving our lives to Jesus Christ. Right? How many of us know that sometimes, I'm going to keep it real, church family, sometimes for some people that goes by the wayside. At one point in our lives, we built an altar to the Lord, but somehow our commitment, distraction came in, offense came in, trouble came in, pressure came in, difficulty came in. And I wonder how many people over the years have said, Joe, I did, if I had known the Christian life was going to be this hard, I would have never given my life to the Lord. I've heard people say that. And so their commitment falls by the wayside. Does that nullify that first altar that they built to the Lord? No, it does not. But how many of us know, listen, I'm going to say this, of course for our sake, but also for the sake of all that will get to hear this message. Listen, perhaps some are in earshot of me listening to this message that you need to build another altar to the Lord, an altar of rededication to Jesus. Right? 
We need to build an altar of rededication. The first altar we'll ever build is salvation, right? We call on the name of the Lord. Lord, forgive me. I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. And we pray that prayer. And now, uh, as we continue walking in him, that's just the beginning of many altars on this journey. Who's with me? Did I lose you? So far, so good, everybody? Right? And we will build altars, but let's be clear, church family, that the tents is what keeps us moving from place to place in life, from moment to moment. And listen, the, the tents is just our part of living life. The altars are what make a difference in our life. Who wants to come to the end of your life and look back on your journey and see a series of altars that were built to the Lord? I do. I want to say, Lord, thank you for this. Do you realize that there's an altar of thanksgiving? We can build that altar every day. When I say that, everybody gets quiet. You know, I, I, I don't complain half as much. I'm, I'm not saying I don't complain. I'm, I just don't complain half as much as I used to. Why? Because I'm a very, very, very blessed man. And I'm not stupid enough to think that all of this blessing came be on, on account of my own hand. No, they came from the sovereign grace of our gracious Lord. And I build, I want to make sure I build that altar every day. I tell my wife, you can ask her, every day I tell her, I'm thankful you're my wife. What am I saying? I'm building an altar. Lord, thank you for this woman. Get through to her, Lord. No. <laughs> I was just checking to see if you're listening, babe. Uh, we have to build those altars every day. You know, when, when, we reded when we dedicated our children to the Lord, who, who's ever done that? It's a, quite an experience, isn't it? What were you doing to the Lord? You were building an altar with that child saying, Lord, take these children. They're yours. I'm going to end on this note because the Lord has been placing this on my heart for the longest time. Listen, do you realize that immersion in water, water baptism is an altar that we need to build to the Lord if we have not already built that altar? I know you, you were baptized, brother. What a, what a glorious moment that was. Some of you might think, well, Pastor Joe, I was baptized as a kid, but I was so young I did not understand the meaning. Okay, that happens. Some other people, and bear with me, okay, I'm not trying to form a doctrine here. <laughs> How many of us know that sometimes it's good to get, quote unquote, rebaptized? I'm not saying the first time didn't take. I'm just saying you didn't understand it. You didn't understand the significance. You know, when I was water baptized, all my friends, all they talked about was the emotional high I was going to get for having been water baptized. And I lost, I lost sight of what ba water baptism represents. It represented my old self going into the grave and my new self in Jesus. Come on, somebody. Coming out of the grave so that I might walk, as Romans 6 says, in the newness of life. Amen. I died. I can say in Galatians, like with Paul the Apostle, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So if I died by, by baptism, water baptism, immersion, full immersion in water, what I'm saying is, listen, I'm going down. My old self is going down in the grave. My new self is coming up out of the water. So let me, let me finish with this invitation. If you have been baptized, but you did it at such a young age, you did not understand the significance of that and have a desire to follow Christ in building an altar of water baptism to signify publicly that you're identifying with the life of Jesus Christ, that he is your Lord, he is your Savior, that your old self has died with him at the cross, right? Identification. And that your new self 
is rising up with his resurrection, listen, I would encourage you for you to come and talk to me. My wife has been very interested, has been talking to me. She said she was just a kid, didn't know what it meant, what it was. But if you're here this morning and you would like to, quote unquote, be baptized, water baptized, immersed in water. Well, Pastor Joe, I was, I was sprinkled. Well, that's nice as a kid, but you got to be immersed in water. Amen. Right? Yeah, it seemed like I said something bad, but it's like... <gasps> Isn't that what the Greek word baptizo means? You wouldn't know this, Scott. To be fully immersed in water like a ship that was sunken in the ocean and, the, and it's immersed through and through. So I want to leave us with that offer. We're, we'll continue the series in the weeks to come. But listen, we need to build an altar of recognizing God as the source of our new life and our identifying with Jesus. Amen? In his resurrection. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for this time together. God, you are so good. Your word is so good. Help us to have this paradigm of life, Lord, that all we're doing in life is building tents, going from season to season to season, from one period of our lives to another period, but all along, Lord, help us to be mindful to build tents, or not build tents, build altars to you. Altars of worship, altars of thanksgiving. Altars that recognize your hand in our lives, even on a daily basis, Lord. For that is, these altars are what make this journey so worth living and so worthwhile. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.